Alrighty, so let's get back into this and see what Ben Ben's story is like. A village sat in a wide valley cut high in the mountains. It was a place of plenty, a gash of green in the otherwise cold state slate rising above on all sides. Those living in the village called the place View. Though those who lived higher in the mountains, mining for precious glints of yellow and blue, called it the trough. Those in the valley treated this name as an insult, for they thought it was a name unfit for their fair village. The people of View, or the trough, had lived there for centuries. They were mostly farmers, though. A fair number of merchants made a home in the valley for most of the year save for the month when they would venture upward into the mining town to sell their harvest bounty at a premium. They would return home with bags filled with chips of yellow and blue tied to their fine leather belts, clinking brightly with the wealth. The next year, they would trade half of their shining flints to the farmers for a share of the harvest that they would, in turn, cart up to the mining villages yet again. Food flowed up and outward from the valley, and the yellow and blue would trickle down, gathering in the valley like a collection basin. This continued for hundreds, perhaps thousands of years. Dozens of generations of farmers, fathers, and merchant sons were born, grew wealthier, and were buried beneath the plush pasture of the valley. Until the beast descended. The mining folk in the higher reaches of the mountains had passed tales of the beast around for as long as their history stretched. At the highest peak of the northernmost mountain, they said, lived the beast. It watched in all directions through slit eyes, judging those below, biding its time until it would enact a righteous calamity. It was a nightmare of immense and terrible power, the miners would whisper. But it was also a patient creature. It would wait until the world below had become irredeemable before unleashing such destruction that its judgment would be fulfilled. It was simply biding its time until an age of selfish sin before cascading down an era of sickness and madness, of fire and char and blood. And one day, after hundreds of generations of farmers and traders had lived and died in the valley, it appeared in view. <laughs> the beast had risen in the trough. I don't know if I'm saying that word right, so don't judge me on my pronunciation. It appeared without warning, with neither sound nor fury. It was simply there. Curled atop four legs, steaming breath rising from a black maw. Leathery wings folded in on its hulking shape. It towered over the center of the village ominously silent. It did not move. It did not even seem to be living, save for the seeping steam billowing from its slime-slicked snout. The village's warriors were called to arms, the ceremonial horn echoing off the walls of the valley. A- Aching? Sure, why not? Aching toward a pregnant silence. After a moment stretching thin, they rushed towards the beast, their spears angled at its massive form. The rest of the village watched from the safety of embroidered drapery as the spears splintered against the beast's hide, the honed blade shattering like glass. The warriors fell to the earth, crying out while their arms, as splintered as their spears, hung lifeless by their sides. The beast did not stir. The village's warriors were buried the next morning, having perished during the night. 
Those who tended to their wounds would later claim their eyes turned black, as if their light was leached from within. The people of you, or the trough, gathered to discuss what was to be done. The beast slumbered, but for how long? Why did it sleep? And perhaps most worryingly of all, how had it arrived in their valley? Not a soul had seen its arrival. It was almost as if the thing had simply materialized in the center of the village. Or, some proposed, it had emerged from the earth itself. But if that were the case, how had the soil, their valuable, rich, rare earth, the source of their plenty and their affluence, birthed such a terrible creature? The villagers wailed for their plight. We have done nothing to deserve this, they cried. We should have not have to carry this burden. But there was nothing to be done. The villagers decided to stay in their valley. The creature slept, and the creature breathed. With each breath, its skin rolled, animating the thorny black scales into a roiling obsidian briar. But it did not rouse. It did not move. It did not rain terror from the skies, nor did it consume children by the score. It slept. The people of Yu sent an envoy to appeal to the miners in the mountain for help. The mountain folk scoffed at the villager in her plush furs and gold adornments. Why should we help you, they asked. The beast has come to an act of reckoning. But perhaps we can be convinced. The envoy returned to the village with the miners' demands. They would continue their trade, and perhaps one day, the miners would come to their aid. The farmers continued to tend their land. The merchants made their yearly trek up the treacherous trails to collect what little chips of wealth the miners had collected in exchange for the farmers' yield. Year after year, however, there seemed to be a little less. A little less harvest. A little less yellow and blue passed around in the snowy alcoves carved from unforgiving rock. A little less green in the valley. A little less light. This continued for twenty years, until the day it began to rain. The people of you, or the trough, watched the clouds roll in not from the south, whence the clouds usually arrived laden with water from a faraway sea, but from the north, where there was but ice and stone and mountain. The rain draped the valley in a dampness that did not relent, but instead crept into every corner. The mountains themselves seemed to sweat and pour water into the valley. The water carried with it a quiet rot. The first harvest after the rains began produced a meager crop, and what little could be gathered was black with mold before the merchants had a chance to trade for the yellow and blue. Their livestock fared no better. The animals began developing weeping sores that became infected and killed with a quick fever. That winter, the people of the trough, or view, watched one another waste away as they began to starve. The envoy was sent back into the mountains to beg for help once again, but found the mines deserted. The people of you were truly on their own. The next harvest was worse. Every last crop had turned mealy and infested before midsummer. By the end of the season, the last of their livestock were dead. The people of the trough watched one another descend into a state of hungry madness, devouring the rotting wood slothing from their homes in slimy heaps, and their fine leather belts that had once held yellow and blue, now sprouting sores of black mold. The village and its residents were rotting away. The beast slept. 
As the rains from the north continued into their third year, the few remaining people in the trough began to prophesy about the beast. It had come and brought with it great devastation, they could agree. It had brought the rains from the north, and it had brought a rot to the village that would not relent. Squatting in what little remained of their crumbling homes, they dreamt of the day the beast would be satisfied by their penance, when it would wake and leave their valley and allow them to farm the land. They dreamt of the day that the miners would return, bringing with them their precious bits of wealth. The time will come, they said, when the beast will wake from its slumber and spread its wings, reaching from one end of the valley to the other, and with a beat those, wing those mighty wings will ascend aloft a squall, and the wind will lift away our rot. The villagers waited for this day to come. A generation came and went, born into the rain and long rotten in the moldy dirt. The few survivors had long abandoned hope that the beast would return to its mountain perch. It was perpetual, a manifestation of their sin. The beast slept. Until it did not. The day the beast awoke, the villagers celebrated. They watched it stretch its long, horrible form into shape, hide shuddering as it shook the decades of rain from its thorny scales. They sang to the beast as it stood uncertainly and reared on its haunches, unfolding the scarred leather wings from one end of the valley to the other. The time of the beast's departure had finally arrived. The time had come for the cleansing wind. The beast beat its wings, emitting a tired and ugly groan as it lifted from the sodding earth. With a final sigh, it shot high into the air, ascending a great crest of wind through the valley that toppled what dismal dwellings remained haphazardly standing. The valley was wiped clean. The villagers were knocked from their feet by the rush of wind. As they struggled upright, they felt the sun on their skin for the first time. They rejoiced, their pale forms dancing in a pitiful display of frailty. They could return to the ways of their ancestors. They could know plenty. They planted their first crop over the grass that even greened, with a newfound acuity for the hunger pains that plagued them constantly. But the grass did not wax green, and the crops did not grow. The decades of rain from the north had left the earth poisoned. There was no going back. They wept, convinced that they were doomed by their ancestors' actions, that the beast had punished them for some forgotten guilt. Their rot had not been lifted. In its place, sterility. The sun shone, but it was upon a new land. A land turned to jagged, unforgiving state. Slate, where perhaps bits of yellow and blue could be scavenged if one dug deeply enough to find a petrified leather belt. That's the end. You remembered all that? Oh, shit, I hit back. That's why I did that. Sorry. You remembered all that? I don't have it with me to read. I obviously remembered it. Did you like it? I did. I'll bring you a coffee. Coffee. Wow, I can speak. What were you doing at Grandpa's house today? Just visiting. But there's no one there to visit. I just wanted to see it. Oh no, it's getting dark again. Oh no. Oh. Why didn't you ask if I wanted to go? We can go together tomorrow. Okay. Did you find anything there? Uh, something for you, actually. What is it? A guitar pick. 
Why would I want a guitar pick? <laughs> it's, cool. it's cool. You could use it. I don't play guitar anymore. We can play together. I don't want to. Okay. You can keep the guitar pick. I don't want it. I... I will. Are you crying? I'm just sad. Is it because that Jesse person kicked you out of your house? Ben, I don't... Or is it because you had to move back home since you couldn't find a job? Mom and Dad are worried about both those things. They think you're sad because of them. Ben... Okay, Ben, give me the phone. Kelly's crying and I want to know why. I know, honey, but please, but let me talk to her, please. Come here, bud. Help me wind up this radio so we can listen to the weather report. Did I do something wrong? Did I do something wrong, Kelly? No, you're fine. Go help Dad. Okay. I'm... I'm sorry you're sad. Hey, Kelly. Are you okay? <sighs> Not really, no. Ben, he... He doesn't understand that. He can't... Ben is fine. He looks up to you so much, you know? I know. Where are you? Are you close to home? I can't tell. It got really dark. I can't believe the sirens are still going off. This might be the longest tornado warning we've ever had. They're saying two more have touched down in the country, in the county. Listen, when you get home, we'll all sit down and have a talk. I think we need it. I like that. You really can't tell where you are? Five miles out? Maybe? Okay, make sure you... What's that noise? Kelly, I'm gonna have to let you go. I... Mom? I... There... I... Mom, you're waking up. Own, Ben, G Mom, Kelly, I, Mom, are you there? No. Shit. Oh no. Oh, don't let the tornado take him out. That's just not nice. That's just still such a fucking terrible cliffhanger. I hate you, game. You're so fucking... Gah! That is so... I hope they're okay. I really, really hope they're okay. They better be. They better be. Oh, yeah, because that looks so enticing and good. It doesn't look like their house like got fucked up at all. <laughs> like with the, with the underwear, it looks like it just got lifted out. It's it's off into flying places. Oh no, it's just oh the rating in this game is so good. I still I just I do love it. I really enjoy it a lot. Oh man. But seriously, what a fucking cliffhanger, my dudes. It's just like, oh yeah, here, this tornado coming, you're driving home. It's pitch black out. You think you're near home, and oh yeah, now your your family has to get off the line because, you know, there's a good chance that tornado's fucking hitting them. Like, oh, I hope you're all okay. But that's, that's the main story done. So there's still the epilogue, which I'm gonna do. But... Oh man, I do like this game a lot, but 
yeah, so that's the end of the part that I'm like re-recording though, because I hadn't started the epilogue in part two. Part two ended at the end of the main story, so hopefully this is gonna be an okay version two, and you guys will be able to actually listen to the whole thing without it doing strange jumpiness and fast forwarding, because that was my whole point. Because I know that's not fun to listen to, it's kind of crap, so hopefully it's be good. So that's all for this part. Next time, let's check out the epilogue and hope our family's okay.